part 3 of our Dragon Law Dive. Today we'll be looking at dragon morphology and biology as well as their society. Let's get started. Dragon Morphology and Biology Dragons are very unique. Very, very unique. They have a seemingly endless lifespan and a huge number of physiological morphs that they can develop into. Yet, we know that every single one of them comes from a single entity, Midgard Sormer, and further from the seven great worms of the first brood. So how is it possible that the legions of dragons came to be? Well, time. The dragons have been here for thousands upon thousands of years, and have had the time to disperse across Hydaelyn and reproduce. How did all the dragons come from one single dragon without a partner? It is because of how the dragons reproduce. Although dragons will identify their gender as either male or female, be it for the sake of convenience or their individual preferences, Every member of the species is actually capable of reproducing asexually. They are technically genderless. The offspring they produce is considered the same race as the parent, but over the course of its prolonged existence, a dragon lives a very different life from its progenitor. It has different world experiences, it meets different things, and undergoes a series of metamorphic changes that result in a creature being vastly different, both physically and mentally, from their parent. Here is an incomplete chart of the potential route a dragon's growth can go. All newly hatched dragons start as dragonets, very small creatures possessed of four legs, a pair of wings, and a long tail. But the form into which they eventually develop will vary extensively from one hatchling to another, all depending on how they behave, what they're like, and what they do. Take Wivens, for example. They start off like any other dragon, but the dragonets who turn into Wivens tend to be influenced by Wind Aether a lot more than any other. And these guys fly. A lot. As a result, their wings grow larger and more powerful, until before long they find little reason to ever return to the ground. If from here they become more balanced in their aether, they would, over time, turn into an elder wyvern. But if they instead go further, allowing wind aether to change their bodies even more, they will transform more. Their bodies become more and more streamlined. Their horns drop off and they become very sleek for fast flight. A wyver. Then, if they want to go all in on wind aether, they can. Losing all their limbs, including their wings. Their connection to the winds are so strong that they're able to control the very flow of air around them, keeping themselves afloat and effectively swimming through the air at frighteningly fast speeds. A falak. Now, again, there are a lot more ways a dragon can develop than what's shown here, but it's a great example for how it works. Be aware that it's not just the aether of the dragons that grow their body in a certain way, but also their mindset. For example, a relatively young dragon, El Tu, went through her first molting during the now peacetime between the dragons and Ishgardians, something no dragon has done before her. Due to her not needing or desiring to become a dragon of war, she developed differently. She grew to look like this. A body that allows her to still use her crafting tools. Thus, ultimately, 
a dragon's body is the result of that dragon's desire and drive. They turn into the form that would best suit what they do. Now moving on to Dragon Society. We should be thankful that the worms have never sought to form a unified nation. For a unified power of all seven great worms and their broods, along with the Dragon King Midgard Sorma, now that would be a powerful nation. Alas, all the dragon's broods are quite distant from each other, yet, paradoxically, they value the ties of blood deeper than most. If their sire calls to them, they will near always answer. This actually creates a sort of ranking based on how long they've lived. For example, if Midgard Sormer calls, literally all dragons on the planet will answer his call if he wills for it. If on the other hand, Horace Valga calls, all his brood and all their young will answer. If Vedofnia calls, then all those side from her line will answer. So, if you think about it, the dragons are actually one unified force in a pyramid scheme. The older a dragon gets will not only get bigger and stronger itself with a lot of experience over time, but will also just naturally accumulate a larger and larger force that it can call upon as time passes. Talking about calling out their brood, the first brood. Yes, we'll never stop talking about them because they're so important to dragon culture them being the second highest on the pyramid and all. These seven creatures all control their brood very, very differently. Some, like Nidhogg, command their brood with near dictatorial authority, while others are aloof and allow their brood to live in near complete autonomy. Some treat their brood like children, others like strangers, others like soldiers. Then each of the dragons under them control their brood in a certain way, and so on. But it all really depends on the first brood. Since the children very often have the exact same value as their progenitor. Moving on! Partnership. Now, even though the dragons are capable of procreating without the physical need to mate, dragons place a great value on emotional and spiritual connections. Betraying a dragon's trust will result in, well, we all know what happened when the Ishgardians killed Ratatoskr. Even though dragons reproduce asexually, they will very often bond in a pair and create a, for a lack of a better word, family, where together they will give their young more interactions to develop in their own unique way. Now, a dragon partnership and pairing is not like marriage in how we understand it. A bond between a dragon and their partner is way stronger. It's literally forever. We see this with Hres Vulgar and his chosen partner Shiva. Their souls are entwined, and I very much believe this is literal. When he consumed her, she spiritually and literally became a part of him forever. He still feels her in his soul to this day. Those two are also a great example in that a dragon can find a soulmate in anything. But yes, they do most often find it in a fellow dragon since, well, to be honest, they just don't interact with mortals a lot and they mostly see mortals existence as being so brief that they can't create connections with them. However, for a dragon to form a partnership, age, birth, race and species doesn't matter. 
Erase Valgar chose a mortal Elizin as his partner. Nidhogg chose one of his own brood children to be his partner. And of course, Bahamut and Tiamat choosing their siblings. So, really, dragon love is anything goes. But what's a family without a pet? Yes, dragons have pets. Uh, sort of. Really, they're closer to being senseless servants. But I still like the idea of dragons having a pet. It's much nicer to say to. These pets are part of what we call a dragon's minions. Now, there's a little distinction we need to go over here. In a dragon horde, there is the Great Worm. This would be one of the seven Great Worms. Under them is what is called a brood. This is their offspring as well as all their offspring's children. Then there is a dragon's minion. This encompasses all of the offspring as well as any scalekin and in Nidhogg's brood, men that are loyal to their cause. A uh, quick overview on what a scalekin is. It's a creature which has a scaly hide that serves as armor. Big surprise, right? Now, I don't want to go too much into beast classifications. We might do that in another video. As all you need to know here is that a scalekin is a very broad family of creatures and something about this particular family makes them very easily manipulated and controlled by dragons. This ability is also not fully understood by us. The dragons just seem to somehow be able to force their will upon the scalekin, kinda like tempering, enslaving them to their will. Now, note that the races of men are under minions for Nidhogg's brood specifically. I'm sure it's of no surprise that Nidhogg saw mortals as inferior. He manipulated them and used them as pawns to attack Ishgard. Men who side with other dragons, for example those who sided with Bahamut before his fall, were known as allies. I mean, shocker, right? But uh, yeah, that's dragon biology, morphology, and society. Next up, we'll go through our final video on dragon lore. And it's a dense one. The dragon language. But for now, goodbye my friends. And have a great day. Bum, bum, bum.